Oops. Keep it secret, everybody. I'm going to start up with Victor. I'm going to ask you two questions. One, I've really loved you to tell us how the Van Las Santa Credits came about because it's such a great story, how you came up with the idea. And the second is, at what point in the process do you sit down and decide how your, the visuals of the film, okay, or how you, what you're aiming for in terms of how the film's going to look? <coughs> All right, it, it, it happened very... Can I, can I point something else? Can you look back, guys, just for a sec? You see... Three people filming, and now there's beautiful girl, woman here. I don't know, sorry, girl, right? So, I don't know in your English, guys. So, did you notice that four people filming, three, only one man there, right? It used to be job for boys. Cam photo camera used to be job for men. Cameraman used to be job for men. It maybe in all history of Soviet cinema, it was only two women cameramen. Now, if you go on red carpet in Venice, seventy percent of people with camera is women, seventy, eight, even more. So it it became. I'm not saying it's good or bad. I'm just you have to notice it. It means it means it became a different job. That's why I believe uh, this job is not for talented people anymore. I'm not saying anything bad about you girls. I'm saying that I believe men, uh, boys, invent this job, and then girls make it livable. Like, um, like, like boy built house, and then woman came, and she made it nice to live uh, there. That's what's going on. That's why I believe talented people now uh, they are not here. I mean, you are, <laughs> you are nice people, guys. And uh, but I believe, like geniuses, maybe they are making social network, Apple computer. Maybe they do something we don't know yet. Maybe we'll face it in ten years' time. But geniuses, they are not in the cinema anymore. Because if you remember it, it used to be time when, for all history of cinema, we knew like, like twenty great filmmakers, right? And now, like thousand films, <coughs> thousand films. Even now, I saw this, and I said, "Look, it's so good films. Actually, good films." So, it's it just and to choose to to. Uh, the, sorry, I just. Get, <laughs> what was your question? <laughs> <laughs> okay, so the first question was how the idea for Viva Nascente Photos came about. The second right. thing was at what point do you consider the aesthetic in the process? Uh, yeah, yeah, so uh, I was sent to North Pole. I was sent to North Pole. Um, I was 20, and I was assistant for camera. It used to be big cameras, not like now. It used to be huge cameras, and we were two, two people, a team, we were sent to North Pole to make film about scientists. And it's like a long journey to go over there. And then only boys there, uh, and they, after a few weeks they start talk about girls definitely, right? So and one of them was Cook, almost like your, um, is it like Cook? Uh, yeah. So one of them was, was Cook. He was <coughs> making food for us, and he was always talking about his girlfriend, which was in same time in South Pole. She was also a scientist, and she was in the South Pole, and. It was time without internet, without mobile phones, without satellites. So it was only possible to connect with her mentally, just think about her. And I was, it was 30 years ago. It, idea came to my brain like, it's almost like, you see this on the, the lacy globe? And so that's how it happened. So then I, for, I forgot it, of course, but then suddenly, I, I suddenly I saw fishermen. Uh, in Argentina, in the middle of Navarre, I saw fisherman. By the way, fisherman. I saw fisherman. <laughs> he was fishing, and his line were going down to the water. It was no one around, and suddenly it came to my brain: What if I will continue this line? Mm. And then I calculated, and, and and it happens that it it came out in Shanghai, in the middle of. Uh, and I call. I send my son to go to Shanghai, and I ask him to to find exactly this spot in op in opposite side of the world. 
and he called me from Shanghai. He said, you won't believe me. There is a woman sailing fish there in the middle of this crowded street. So uh, my English is not good enough because you're not laughing. Eh? <laughs> <laughs> Okay, so the second question was, at what point in your process do you think of how you're going to have visuals of the film, the aesthetic? Yeah, that, that's why I um, kind of, I imagine when we are a child, we have great questions, right? One of the great questions we had in life, like, we have a lot of, like, there is Santa Claus, so there is no Santa Claus, so on, so And one of them, in my opinion, I believe you also have, who is there? If you dig from here, down, 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 who is there in opposite side? And they're supposed to walk upside down, right? And if they walk upside down, why they don't fall down? So, and for me it was image already, like, that's why I split screen, like, the top was people in Argentina and, and, and the bottom was people in Shanghai going upside down. So, it's kind of, actually I never go from his story. Uh, people always say, tell story, we have to tell story. I actually don't think we have to tell story. I believe we have to show story, so it's kind of different. That's why I don't start with story, I don't start with message, I don't start with idea, I don't start with something I want to say. I start with image, and for me it was this image when I am here and someone upside down in the same frame, in the bottom part of the frame. This was image, so the rest was not me, my hand. <laughs> Okay, I'm going to follow that on with Mike, because off-label is very much driven by story. Like you had to, I think there's eight characters that you have that you Yeah, follow. yeah. So they kind of had to come first in, in your, your mind, I guess, before you sort of perhaps how you were going to shoot them. How do you, making a film like that, how much of the priority to you is the visual over, say, the message? And when you're shooting, how do you prioritize one or the other, or do you not? Well, I think, I mean, when you're shooting, you're just, I, I, you know, I, I agree with, I think one of your, you have the list of the, one of, one of the things I definitely do is just not think when I'm shooting. Um, I do a lot of thinking beforehand. That rule five. It, rule five, rule right? Five. Yeah. So, <laughs> well, you wrote them. Yeah, I did, but I, 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 I wrote it, but I didn't think it was, it would be popular. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but it's, a, it's actually a good, a good tenet in the idea that when you, are filming, you're not really thinking anymore. You're just trying to simply be there. Um, so I guess, I mean, uh, how I approach that is just what's going on in that moment, what's, what's possible to do. It's actually really practical. Like, I don't, I, don't really, I don't really like to go into aesthetics or talk so much about it, because I, I may have my own thoughts about them. But when it really comes down to it, it has to do with, OK, there's a person sitting in front of a window, and the window's got too much sun in it. And how am I just going to get an exposure on the person's face? And oh my god, the sound isn't working. And this person's grumpy, and they want coffee. And you know, you just are trying to get something, you know? So, uh, I mean, I hate to just demystify that. But then at the same time, you know, you spend a lot of time trying to have as much uh, resources at your disposal when you're shooting. Um, but I, I've forgotten the first part of the question about the character first or the... Yeah, which, which do you prioritize in that moment? Like, or is it just, is it pure... Instinct? The priority is, is, is simply the, the person or the individual or the in environment that you're in. How to disappear as much as possible, but also obtain what you're feeling from that. So, um, and off label is a strange one for us because it's it is so kind of story driven or character driven. But um, in the end, we don't know where it's going. So we're not trying to get something specific from that moment. We're trying to be available in that moment to just gather what is going to happen and hope that we can shape something later with it. Um, and then that maybe informs the next time you go back. But. I think that's really interesting because we're finding there's, as technology is moving forward in the documentary, we're finding better quality of visuals within documentary. Mm -hmm. And I think it's getting to a part where we've fixed it. Like the more massive difference between fiction and documentary is there's no control, really. Mm -hmm. to a point, I, mean, I think with a film like yours, you have much more control. 
let's say, if you want to conflict. But that's the most exciting thing is the lack of control. Exactly. I mean, that is completely yeah. exciting to me. That, yeah. That's why I do it. I mean, if you could control the situation, it, I, I don't know. I just, it's not as much fun. I mean, it's the idea that you're going to miss it. Ah, like, you know, I mean, somebody, or you do the wrong thing. You know, you're watching the footage later, and you're like, why am I doing this? Ah, you know, like, that's the worst feeling in the world. And this is a good thing to yeah. actually, because in fly fishing, you're shooting in water. You could miss moments. There are going to be moments. I mean, the moments in the film are just, you know, you can't have planned any of that. So is it just a case, like fly fishing, where you're just waiting? You're just in there with them, and you're waiting for that moment? Yeah, well, <clears throat> um, I hadn't, before we made this, I hadn't really watched any other fly fishing films. And, um, but uh, after we kind of started um, talking about it, I, I went and watched a few. And they're mostly kind of like these, like, um, uh, hard, you know, hard rocks music set to, you know, these guys catching yanking big fish, and <laughs> it's like it's like a it's it's, it's a really strange um, kind of uh, for me um, something that's so you know peaceful and poetic to be set to like you know rock music where guys are like holding up big fish. It was just um, I guess incongruous. You know what, how I feel about when I'm fishing or whatever. So, um, uh, you know, one thing that that uh, that most of those videos have are, you know, the fly on the water, the the fish taking the fly, um, the hook set, and the fight, and then landing the fish, and then the release. So, um, we decided early on that we were just going to throw that out the window because what we were going to on was kind of the moments between uh, between the fishing when they were um, you know uh, interacting and to focus on capturing that. So we, I mean, we got um, we we definitely focused on getting the visuals and and everything, but uh, for us the, the more important aspect of capturing was the interpersonal. Um, and you know, we shot two cameras for, for throughout. Um, but uh, and and really kind of covered the scenes um, with the two of them uh, in a fairly traditional way when they were actually interacting, whether on the water or whatever. But um, yeah, we, I mean, we were <laughs> uh, in the middle of winter, wading waist deep uh, with you know um, some pretty big cameras, and uh, and it was it was it was not fun. <laughs> um, I mean, the water was you know below 32 degrees, and uh, um, but I guess what what was the rest of your question? That was good, but that's my question. I think. Okay. Um, and Fish, I'm going to ask you: yeah. your project's a bit different. In the Vanishing Spinlight is one of four films. Yeah, yeah. Making. And each show a different stage in life. Mate, do they each set around the same street? Yeah, they're neighbors. Yeah. Okay, great. So, so, when you're approaching shooting something like that, are you thinking in a full film frame of mind? Um, do your does your choice of shots, or do you have you done one each? Um, you kind of you kind of shot the three back to back. Yeah, sure. Um, so when you are approaching shooting like that, are you shooting everything at once, and then you're breaking them up? Uh, yeah. yeah, I think, you know, like, when I was shooting, I never thought about uh, I would uh, come up with a structure like that for the project. But, um, you know, as time goes along and uh, as we're collecting more materials, I think there is a, a possibility for that to happen. So that's just naturally end up to be like that. So, um, you know. Uh, so, yeah, great. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> I'm going to throw out a question to everybody. Okay. Um, Often, and we've had this recently, is that there have been fiction films that are said to use documentary techniques in terms of their visual style, and often that's kind of derogatory to documentary because it means either the footage is shaky or it doesn't have a certain structure, and it's this idea of what the representation of reality is a documentary gives you, and the audience expects a certain look as what is real. And all of your films completely throw that out the window because they're not that kind of visual. So do you think that an audience will, I mean, this is something that's been criticized with the use of the 5D and things like that, is that because it's so beautiful, it doesn't feel real. Mm. Do you think this is a problem? and that, Or do you think this is something audiences will just adapt to and that they should? I actually, it works, you know? Yeah. 
actually even specially made it against, I know it's, for some people it will be disturbing, for some people will say it's fiction film, and I'm sorry to say I made it for purpose. I don't want to follow these rules anymore. Because um, simply too many films, too many films, it's, it means, <clears throat> by the way, uh, did you have experience to film 35? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah? So, when you film 35, I don't know, you, have, you don't have a lot of material. And if you look to the history of cinema, everything we call documentary, it's not 100% documentary. Because I used to be a camera assistant many years, and I know, you go to film, and they give you like only two minutes a day. Only two minutes material a day, and you have to film something. And you are waiting for a moment when the door open, and you don't know when it will open. Then it, when it's open, you're too late. Then you have to say, oh, I'm sorry, can you, can you just go again? And, and I would say, I wouldn't say 100%, but at least 50% of documentary we are watching, even flyer team, even flyer team. It's actually partly big part of fiction. So, and Vertov, it was even classic what you know, part of this was fiction. For example, now, do you know this prereq option in, in red camera? This is revolution or thing, more, more than everything else. In pre, do you know pre-rec option? This is absolutely fantastic. Pre-record. Pre-record, yeah. So in, rec, in red camera and in, in Sony F3, I believe, as well. So there is an option that you can stay by, stand by and wait for the moment door will open. And then you just press button. And 30 seconds before, it's already in your magazine. So this is absolute. This is the moment when you really go to documentary back kind of, you don't need to ask people, do it again, say it again. It, it used to be like somebody talking, and then some, you said a nice word, and I did not record it, and then I said, oh, can you repeat this? Oh. It was always kind of question. And so this is a revolutionary moment at the moment. We, we, and in fact, we are coming back to, to real cinema, because best documentary looks like in time, in time, in 20, in 100 years time, if you look now, flyers, it doesn't matter, it's fiction or documentary, right? It doesn't matter, it's a piece of art, piece of art. And if you look, if you look to the good who, fiction movie, it's also not fiction anymore, it's, piece, it's a document of talent, of, of talent of Tarkovsky or Bergman, it's, it's, they're coming together. It's good film in time will be like wine, better. Bad film, doesn't matter, it's fiction or documentary, it will die. <laughs> And just in a quick moment, does anyone have any questions? Because we only have, we don't have Victor for too long. So, is that a question? Yeah, yeah. I have a question actually. Going off that, you know, the, now things are more real and that we can capture the actual moment instead of trying to recreate it. But we're now able, through digital video, to shoot so much footage, we're almost able to create whatever story we want. And you know, it's kind of like the, 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 the filmmaker's ability to manipulate reality. Sorry, guys. I, uh, if you want to answer, but I will. I will brief you. You know, the the point is, I believe the point is, what is the moment when you are happy? I mean, what we are doing? We are trying to be happy in our way, right? In in the moment I'm filming, I'm most happiest person on the planet. So I because I look into the camera and I see something no one saw before. And this makes me happy, and I don't need to change anything, because if I change something, it doesn't make me happy. If I, if I create something, but if, if something happens unpredictable, and I'm ready to, to film it in my way, and in front of my eyes, something happens, something that you never can imagine, and you're able to film it, it's, it doesn't 
that's really kind of topic of your job. I mean, if you cry when you're filming, then everything doesn't matter, I, I believe. Do, do, do you understand? I'm trying to answer, but so it's, it means the, 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 the point why you're filming is still the same. It doesn't matter if you're trying to be fictional to, to make documentary. Why are you doing this? If you're doing to save world or to say message, forget it. Then whatever you do, it, you do message, you know? But if you're making films, it must be something inside you pushing you to do it. Am I right? Yes. <laughs> I'll, throw, I'll throw this out to Pish as well. Yeah. The, the question being that because you can, it's so it's so easy to shoot so much now. It's very easy to misrepresent the truth. Do you find that, or because perhaps you're not having to choose your shots so specifically? Sure. Is it is it a blessing or a curse to be able to shoot so much? Well, I think it's. Um it's a, it's a, it's about uh, how you um, how you sort of perceive reality almost because uh, reality just keep on going and uh, you know in the sense that uh, nowadays technology allows you to just uh, continuously record but if you just throw that onto the screen everybody's just gonna fall into sleep even if you edit it you know sometimes you fall into sleep but it's just uh, I think it's about uh, you know, like reconstruct the materials you have shot and uh, represent it in the way that how you have perceived the reality you have experienced, uh, in the sense to be uh, truthful to that. And I think, you know, in, in that sort of sense, you know, no matter if you're shooting like 20 minutes a day or 200 hours a day, as long as you can recreate that sort of reality you have. Uh, physically and mentally experienced, I think, then that would be considered as a documentary for me. You know? Yeah. So. I, I, yeah, I completely agree. I mean, I think, I think that, um, you know, that's where kind of ethics and your respons responsibility as a filmmaker really um, comes into play. Um, I, you know, I, you know, I, I don't believe that you need to, you know, be fly on the wall shooting verite, not interact with your subject kind of thing. Um, it's it's much more kind of um, uh, your responsibility to your subjects and to your audience to um, portray, uh, as Fish said, the uh, reality that you experienced and you feel, and um, and kind of uh, get uh, you know uh, project whatever feeling or idea or theme or, uh, you know from a specific scene to. Um, the, your entire story and present that in uh, as um, truthful a way to you as possible and that's kind of where the art comes in too I believe because you're you know I mean all of us inject our own point of view whether or not you're shooting verite or, or, or you know a much more manipulated controlled um, type of uh, project but um, yeah it, I mean, that's where your responsibility as a filmmaker really is, uh, comes in. Yeah, I, get, I like calling it creative nonfiction, <laughs> you know, because it's, it's the underlying, like you, you both were saying, it's, there's, the, there's the underlying, you know, truth or truthiness of the situation that you're uh, exploring, but then the ways that you present that can, can be very, very different. Um, to speak to, you're saying you can, we can film everything, and you know, uh, I actually think the more you film, uh, the worse it gets because you have more and more and more options, and it's just forget it. It's, it's too much. I think you should be making decisions while you're filming. I want to film this. I want to sit here. I want to turn the camera on now. You know, I want to turn it off. But I also think that it's okay sometimes to say, "Could you just open the door again?" You know, because you're thinking about something. I don't think that's too bad to do, but I think it's bad to do when you, you have to do it at the right time. No, no yeah. if it's yeah. crucial. Yeah. My film, my first film I made in Reshi one to one. It was one to one. I was start, I, I start to film film about philosophy, and I was a student in film school, and I did not have any material, and I, I bought just. Uh, 
the how do you call it? The rest, uh, like small pieces, like 20 meter, uh, 30 meters, just pieces from the rest of the. So, and I start to film, and then Sakurov knew that I'm doing this film, and he sent me a present, six, 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 uh, 300 meters, how do you call it? 10 feet, 10, 10, uh, thousand foot. 10, yes. feet, yeah. okay. six. And I made the film exactly 60 minutes, so <laughs> one to one. So, and now my last film was like one to 200. <laughs> so it's kind of abs absolutely opposite. In, you guys decide, I mean, a lot of the films I've been seeing, uh, you know, some of your films uh, do this, they're primarily for the verite, you know, not really having like sit down interviews and that kind of thing. But I mean, at what point do you decide that you're not going to do that or do that, you know, where you obviously are interviewing people to at least build the film, as well as maybe following them, even if you're not necessarily trying to use it, do you decide at some point midway that, you know, oh, I've got enough good interviews that I think I will use these, or have a, is it an absolute decision that it's verite from the start? Any thoughts on that? I, I guess it just, for me, it just varies. I mean, I, I don't actually like the sit-down interview. I think it's, it's rare that they're good. Um, I think there are people who are really skilled at getting those things, uh, at making the, the person feel comfortable enough in that situation. Um, but I much prefer the life unfolding aspect. But then you also run up against reality and that you can't uh, sometimes get that. Sometimes you can only get a person who wants to do a sit-down interview or something like this. So, But I think that by, as you keep filming, there's also things that you feel like when you're constructing, you feel that you need. You know? So you maybe go back and you ask a person a question uh, you know, to, to fill that gap if you feel it's important. And you know, again, that's constructing reality in ways you don't want to construct, but you know, you're also a dictator on reality as the <laughs> filmmaker, and so you know. Um, sometimes I find that I can't trust my conscious decisions on set that much. Uh, it's just because how we perceive things, because. Uh, when you go back and look at the rushes, and sometimes the, it, uh, the most exciting moments happens at uh, the, the least expected sort of uh, uh, situations. And you, when, you, when you were shooting, you probably didn't even notice that ha has happened. You know? So I, I guess probably you just have to trust yourself in, t in, in, in a more of a meditative way. And uh, it's almost like subconsciously you recorded something that you think like uh, that, that, that made sense, and you somehow felt it in your guts instead of in your head. You know, so uh, I guess that's my experience. Yeah. Uh, how do you approach your post-production? And knowing that you can get so much more footage nowadays, how do you, do you sit down and you really look through it all, or how do you approach things as you go along? I have a special method, uh, maybe. <laughs> Maybe someone interesting. Uh, maybe because I used to be editor before, and I invent such strange method. So my method is opposite of what normally people do. Normally, if you have, uh, let's say, 20 hours material, you need to make one hour film. What you do first, you make four hours film. Then you make three hours film. Then you make two hours film. Then you make one hour film. You hold it down. Yeah. If you have 20 hours material, if I have 20 hours material and I need to make one hour film, first I make 20 minutes film. So I uh, first I choose crucial material for the film, like a skeleton, skeleton. Mm -hmm. Like I know what without this shot, without this shot, and without this shot, my film will not exist. And then then I make it bigger. So. That's help to not to die in in, in hundred hours of <laughs> material because actually what what the best what that's what I said when I, when I film and I'm crying I know this is must be in the film because it it was absolutely unpredictable it was kind of combination between situation my movement of my camera it happened in front of my eyes and you know it's supposed to be in the film. And also dramaturgy for me, it's not, 
That's why I believe that dramaturgy is not telling story. Dramaturgy, in my opinion, is kind of you have, let's say, you have five, six shots, which is crucial for your movie, and you have to imagine that you, you, you cannot just put them one after another. Because even you put this two, six shot different order, it's going to be different film. Even, even this only six shot, even this 20 minutes. You just put them differently, it's a completely different idea. So it means my, my way of making dramaturgy is to, to find the last one, to, to find the last shot and then to make possible that you will not leave room in the first one, and then to be make something that you will able to understand the last one, and to even forgive me for the last one, because last one always tough. And, but if you, to accept, I, I, want, I want to do something that you will accept it, and you will not say, Victor is fucking asshole to film it. Because in the beginning I want to show you something that you love me and you forgive me that in the end I will show you a tough story. <laughs> I think that's, that we're going to have to end with you there, Victor, because you have to go through the training. So you do some See you later. Hello. Hello. I actually, I wouldn't mind following Please, that question a little bit because I agree with you. Uh, Definitely finding the, the right key moments and, or you sort of know what you're going after or going towards. I had this, uh, I also kind of started out doing editing and uh, my first teacher was this guy who um, we shot something. He said, okay, well, uh, let's, now we got to watch the footage. Uh, we're capturing, so we were shooting something digitally uh, at that time. So he, we got the rushes and we had to capture it off of tape. And so we were watching the footage as it was going in. And he says, we have to watch all this now. And uh, I said, uh, really, I mean, should, should we just go, maybe go out and have a cigarette or something while, it, while it's doing it stuff? He's like, no, no, this is the chance to watch. It's important to watch, you know, all the way through. I said, okay. So we're sitting there and watching, and he just, <laughs> just completely goes to sleep. And I'm looking at him like, what the, you know, come on, like, hey, wait. We have, you said we we're supposed to watch this. He says, "No, no, it's, it's fine. It's still going in." You know, he was, he was sleeping with. He said, "It's fine. It's still washing over me for the first time." You know, <laughs> okay, Drew, that's I, I believe you there. You know, um, but it's kind of true because you do watch stuff and you do kind of go narcoleptic when you're trying to. You know, I mean, when we start editing a film, really intensely editing a film, I cannot. I, I can't even focus. I just want to fall asleep the whole time. Because all I'm thinking is, oh my god, I have to make another film <laughs> you know, out of this material. And you just, uh, like that. So you do a lot of watching. But things go in. And they go in in sort of odd ways. There's, still, there's always like four or five things that are, oh my gosh, this really must happen. But there's all this intermediate stuff that comes out of just randomly watching. Or sleep watching, or you know whatever. Yeah. Um, yeah. I just have a quick question for Michael. Um, can you tell me what's your background in the music video and things like that, where there's you have a lot of quick cuts and and make perhaps the music dictates somewhat of the storyboarding or something when you guys come up with an idea, perhaps? Is it the opposite with a documentary when you're picking, you know, music and things oh. like that, the approach. Well, I mean, a music video, you know, it's you're you're, you're making a, uh, it, this the song is is the most important. So you're sort of doing something to support that. You're also trying to sneak in your work in the middle of the commercial for the band. But you know, at the same time, that's what's going on. So that I, I feel this the best for me. The best approach is to really work with the rhythm of the music in you know in an editorial way that's strong and solid. I don't I don't storyboard things. I may write the concept out or something and you know for the purposes of shooting the video you say okay you know for the first two hours you're gonna be doing this sequence and then that sequence. But I'd much rather just start shooting and figure out what you're what you're doing in that situation. I think it's very reasonable 
thing to do, especially in a music video, because you know you can get away with so much because it's you know the music is screaming on the soundtrack and it's just image, 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 image. You know that's that's easy to do, but it's also difficult to do it in a way that really gets cuts through the mustard, you know, for for a viewer. Because so many, you know, for example, so many music videos are just all this quick, quick, quick cut type of stuff, but there's no f sensibility or feeling behind that. Um, when you're doing documentary or, or any other form, I think that, I mean, the form or the thing that you're doing dictates what you're, what and how you're approaching the edit. And actually, like, you know, um, off-label is interesting because there's eight different stories and eight different tones and eight different places, which is a ludicrous thing to do. Don't ever do it. Don't don't make film with eight. It's a dumb idea. But but it was a good challenge to, to do. But it was like a, a weird one editorially because each character has a very different cadence. It's not like a a family drama where there's say six characters, but they they're all under the same house. They're all so there's this sensibility of a whole moving. You know you. you you're feeling that through. It's it's actually in a way easier, you know. But this one was different, and they have different editorial styles. And the trick is actually to make it seem like they're not different. That the audience is watching, and they're not watching editing. Because I actually I hate that. I hate the fact that you know sometimes your editorial, whatever trickery or whatever the things that you're doing. I want them to be seamless. I don't want people to be thinking about the editing. You know, I don't want them to be thinking about the cinematography. In fact, I, I'm like loath to hear. You know, say you show a film to somebody and they say it's so beautiful, and it's like, ugh, you know, because you, you want them to say it. That really affected me. That when that person said that, or when this happened, because that's why you're making it. You're not making it to say, to make it beautiful. But music does play a huge role in our work. But the music comes after, you know, in, in our in our work. Uh, so we shape the scenes and then construct some. Maybe maybe we have some music laying around that we we create and then try to drop in and make it work and then re-record it, you know, that kind of thing. So. That's Following up, I'm going to come at the question. I want to ask you guys a question. Mm -hmm. and within the last few years, there have been a lot of developments in technology. We have the 5D, the 7D, and there's becoming different aesthetics within When it comes to films, say like a war film, and you make a very beautiful war film, a lot of audiences don't like that. They feel like you're misrepresenting something, or it shouldn't be. It shouldn't look like that. If you're making a certain type of film, it should look a certain way to look as realistic or as powerful as possible. I'd love to know from you guys, like, how do you feel about that? Does it matter to you? Would you rather have the most beautiful film possible, or do you feel it does is to the detriment of certain subject matters? Well, I think it, it, you know, I think that the fact that somebody makes it beautiful is their aesthetic and it's their view of it. So that's part of what we want to see is how they might do something. I mean, I've heard with uh, Low and Clear, which I've not unfortunately heard, is a very beautiful film. In other words, there's a, there's a lyric quality to it. Well, that's how you, then people have told me, that's how you view the things that you did. So I want to know that's how you look at that experience, because that's part of the interpretation of so the filmmaker's vision is ultimately the thing that yeah. you're looking for most, irrespective even of Even a dark, I mean, even with a dark, it's not necessarily has to be reportage. Mm -hmm. Is there a difference between uh, something being beautiful and uh, like say, uh, saying something that your film was beautiful and that the cinematography was great, and yet the message is generally what somebody is saying. Mm -hmm. And oftentimes it's like in uh, antiquities, there's, there's very little, it's a very spare dialogue. And yet those things are they really spice it quite a lot. Mm -hmm. But it's a visual that's really important. And I, I would assume that Kelly in your film, I haven't seen it, but I've heard it's a beautiful film, but I, I would imagine also that the dialogue between the two men is very, very important to it also. And that there's a counterplay that you all use in terms of uh, introducing one part to the other, the dialogue that the uh, Beautiful cinematography, also. Yeah, well, <clears throat> um, yeah, I think uh, I, my day job, I, I shoot for other people. So um, 
I, I have a tendency to kind of want to make things look as good as I can. On the other hand, you know, I am a strong believer that um, your story really does need to dictate how you shoot the film. And, um, you know, if, if I was shooting some, if, if I had made a film about, uh, you know, about something where, you know, um, the, the grittiness and kind of the shaky camera and, and, and giving it that, like very um, kind of visceral feel uh, or, or immediate feel um, was important for the story, then, then I definitely would have shot it that way. Um, the way we approached uh, right from the beginning when we were talking about it was um, to have the, the uh, visuals just complement the, 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 the real story and what was important. And, um, and so um, we actually shot it in a way to make it feel as much like a fiction film as we could. So, um, you know, uh, we weren't, uh, th th it's not a social issue doc. Um, there's <laughs> not, not there is anything that you'll learn from the film that, that it, you know informationally um, that is going to help the world or whatever. I mean, it's very much about um, uh, uh, you know uh, uh, about uh, just friendship and um, the dynamic between old friends and and, and hopefully um, you know it, the, the film talks about. Um, you know those kinds of ideas, and, and 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 so it wasn't that important to us to make the film um, feel real in the traditional documentary uh, language. Um, it it uh, we definitely tried to push it towards the you know we shot in widescreen, um, which I think really complements not only the um, the, uh, the the landscapes, but it's also very nice when you're shooting two people. Um, because you can get uh, a close-up, a two-shot close-up. Um, so, you know, these are all things that we had talked about. Um, but, uh, but again, I think, you know, the most important thing is that the visuals complement whatever the focus of the film is. Do you, do you, I have a question. Do you adapt your, so you adapt your, um, your stylistic approach to each uh, individual, let's say, work of your own? You know? Do you, you you prefer the adaptation to the to the? Well, to the I mean, this is the, the the first feature that I had made, um, but the other uh, I'm working on another project uh, that um, I think the uh, doesn't lend itself to more cinematic look, um, and it actually lends itself more to uh, you know the characters are talking to me behind the camera um, some of the time, and so actually having the person. Uh, or having the audience really feel like um, they're looking through my eyes is much more important than um, than whether or not the image looks beautiful. Um, so, um, so I guess, yeah. I mean, I I, I think it's um, I, I like to adapt what you know adapt based on um, you know the, the subject. Matter. Uh, you had mentioned uh, that you weren't interested in the story originally when your critter to your friend had um, proposed it. And I was kind of curious to know what process you had to go through to find the potential in the story. That you might kind of touched on it a little bit here. Uh, um, yeah, well, yeah, when, when my, my partner, co-director, um, Tyler, uh, first called me and asked me if I wanted to make a fly fishing movie, uh, a movie about fly fishing, um, my first reaction was, no, I don't. Um, just because I um, I was kind of picturing a you know a sports movie um, type of thing, um, and I guess the I I slowly kind of got more interested in 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 telling the story through fly fishing. Um, you know when I really kind of started thinking about um, how it could be used as a metaphor. And that was really exciting to me. Um, and uh, and it wasn't until we started shooting and I saw that we could we could create something um, that was more like a you know a, a feature like anecdote <laughs> um, that I really kind of realized it was potential. I think it's 
it's, it's really interesting with kind of the dynamic between the two of you about the reactions of people calling their films beautiful. Because I think a film like Off Label had another filmmaker made it or made it five years ago. The concern of how it would look perhaps wouldn't be the same as you've chosen. In that I think when Nordics watches it, they're struck by how beautiful it is as well as being having all the other elements. It's almost as if to, to perhaps, I mean, anyone watching it, it didn't need to be mm, yeah. as aesthetically striking as it is. Whereas to Khalil, perhaps, when someone says it's beautiful, you react in a different way. I don't know, it, maybe it's the subject matter, maybe it's, it's, it's for, the reaction yeah. that you're looking for from the film in terms of what you were going for. I mean, maybe it's to our advantage that we go to such, Jesus, such dark material that, um, I mean, it's weird because I mean, the last film before October Country deals with some pretty heavy family issue stuff. And I mean, when people would ask me questions about why you film it a certain way or what, it's so beautiful and what were those choices. I mean, there's beauty everywhere, even in the stuff that's really, really awful. And especially in the stuff that's really, really awful. Um, so maybe the beauty is in, in a way a reaction to or revolt against, you know, the horror that you're also capturing. But I don't really know. I mean, I, I, I that's the reason I asked you the question is because I was thinking about how limited I am, really, when I think about. I, I approach things this almost the same way. Yeah. It's just you go in and you do what you try to do. Well, but it's really putting a stamp, you know. That's really saying. That's why I think it's limiting. I, th I think you just you're just I'm just stomping on, you know, something, and, and then I try to say that oh gee, you know, I'm trying to be as transparent as possible and fly on the wall. Like what nonsense, actually, because you know you're imposing your style and in a way I think that's what's so much more freeing about your ability to do that to step back and say you know I'm going to do that like that 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 to me is much more open than the way I, I describe myself you know I mean I think I guess from a filming perspective and I'm just making an assumption here is that you are just making the best choices as you go as you feel you want to make the best whereas to an audience they may see a film like off label and think that's an amazing film, but isn't it beautiful as well? And I think perhaps that's the reaction rather than it's beautiful, we, we haven't seen all this other stuff in it. I think perhaps we're used to seeing films that haven't, like like Oblo, but haven't considered the aesthetic as much as you have. I just think about the time is when you see Friends film and you don't like it that much and you try and focus on the positives. Yeah. And, you know, like I always think that's what's happening maybe. It's, you know, my own neur neuroses. <laughs> I mean, I want, I want to ask you a question, because, because your film is the difference <coughs> on this panel is just it's such a long period of time. Yes. Did you find, I mean, I imagine even approaching that in terms of this style, sure. you're going to be filming over many, many years. Yeah. Do you have any fear that when you begin and what you end up with are going to look completely different, or that you might want them to look completely different? Do you even think in that way, or do you just use your instinct as you go? I think the, 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 the shooting style of the film has changed drastically throughout the whole uh, shooting. It's because how, you, how well you have absorbed into the uh, environment and the atmosphere. And I think, you know, I, I've learned a great deal from an old uh, Japanese documentary master from the 60s called Ogawa Shinsuke. Um, he, he went on with his team and did a film in the field for like 13 years. And uh, he abandoned uh, most of his materials from the six years he had been shot to the first six years, and uh, because he said that you know, like in order for you, for you to be able to represent like the what what you like the environment you were in, you have to firstly embody it, you know, to to embody it in the sense that uh, then you would be able to be part of it. You would be synchronized with it with its rhythm, with its uh, feeling, with its sense and everything, then the visual comes after. So uh, the more you've been absorbed into the environment, the, the better you are synchronized with it and the, the, the visuals will go closer to what it's supposed to be, I think. Yeah. So I'm, I'm open to be, to be always changing towards what I feel is the most suitable at that moment, yes. We have time for a couple of questions. 
the way that Victor talked about editing his movie, the audience was sort of very present. It seemed like he and very personal. Like I want, I want them to love me, and I want them to forgive me. Um, and I wondered for you, just if you could talk about that, if you have. And I heard Kurt, or I read something. Kurt Vonnegut said he would write for like his sister. Always, every book was for his sister as an audience. And so, I wondered if, in general, you would just talk about like your relationship to the audience in making the film, and then too, if you do have a specific audience, and then maybe on that too, like being so. It seems like everybody is more savvy. Like everybody is more aware of editing and how things are shot down. I wonder. Like, is there a way that you can, are you thinking of the savvy audience, like your friends who like see your, can see through the editing techniques and the shooting techniques or any of those? <laughs> uh, for me, very quickly, I, I, I would think that uh, every film is almost like a person and uh, the person will meet those who like each other and who just don't like each other <laughs> and uh, for for the first sight you know you look at the, you look at someone just like oh, i don't like that one you know? <laughs> something like that <laughs> you, you know like you build that kind of personal relationship with the film as well i think that's how it goes you know you you just be who you are and uh, don't think too much of how you sh you shall be perceived by others yeah. Yeah. Do you, do you have an audience in mind when you're together? Um, <clears throat> I, I, um, my audience is, is I mean, I, you always have to be conscious of your audience, uh, but uh, my audience is, is really myself, and, uh, and beyond that, um, my wife sees my film a lot, uh, pieces, and, uh, um, but, uh, as far as to your question about um, you know the savviness of your uh, audience, um, to me, I, I never want people to come up and and ask me, "Hey, did you use a lens, baby, in your film? You know, how'd you get those shots? You know, um, which is fine. I get you know for the more technically savvy people, I guess." Um, uh, that want to know that kind of thing, it's, it's fine. But I mean, you know, like with anything with editing um, and, and with camera work, you want, uh, you know, I always kind of strive for um, all that to be as invisible as possible, um, you know, as, as has been talked about. So so anything that's, that I, I think, anything technically that I feel like is going to draw attention to itself um, at, as a type of filmmaking, uh, as a filmmaking process, you know, um, I definitely try and avoid that. Um, anything, um, you know, there's there's a couple sequences in in the Fountain Long Clear that are you know jump cuts, but that's 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 a good example of a, of an editing technique that can at times draw attention to itself um, if it's if it's done very consciously. Um, and so, um, you know, that's that's a technique that um, I think works really well under very specific conditions um, and, uh, and isn't something that someone, you know, if it's done right, then people aren't going to come up and say, hey, you know, I like that jump cut sequence. <laughs> you know. um, they'll be more focused on, you know, the meaning of that scene. Um, I, I think you have to satisfy yourself first. I mean, your, your aesthetic your aesthetics, you know, you have to satisfy, satisfy those first. In the case of, you know, Donald and I make films together, and uh, we share a lot of aesthetic, or you know, but then we also have a lot of uh, divergent, you know, thoughts on things. And so, what's interesting when we work together is the compromise that comes out of those two things, which I think makes the work better. But in the end, I think we both would agree that you know, with each other, we said, no, you have to satisfy your own concerns first. See, I, the audience is you, um, but it's not so solipsistic and, you know, you are making a, a work that you want to go out into the world. So there is a, a sense of, you know, is this going to work or not? But I think just because you simply exist in a culture, you have that sensibility in the same way that you have that sensibility tied to your aesthetics. They're all, they're all connected. So, um, but I love that, that 
I love that. That's incredible. Like ah, uh, yeah. It's yeah. weird because you know when you when you go into a movie, like for me, it's like the first three minutes I'm on the bus or I'm not on the bus, you know, or like. <laughs> or have you ever seen a movie where you're you you like the film but you think I never want to sit across the table from that filmmaker, <laughs> or like, or I'd love to have a conversation with that person. I really want to meet that person. And there's all these weird things that you feel that the film is so weirdly transparent in that way. The, you convey so much through this the ether, you know, with with any kind of work, a work of music, a work of you know, a work of film. So, I think that stuff all comes through, you know. Can we have time for one more question? Yeah. Yes, I'm wondering. Uh, you know, we'd like from the three filmmakers if you could tell me um, what is your process in choosing the music that you're going to to be using for the film. And how do you decide to use it? Oh, uh, uh, this film didn't have any music in it. I think it's because um, I think uh, like when we when we live in the reality that we always uh, take the sound of the reality for granted too much. So sometimes I think it's just good to be silence in a sense, relatively speaking, and just to be aware of like what's going on in the environment because that's probably the most suitable sound for that moment. And if you want to enhance something like specifically, then you probably add like a sound effect or music to it. But in, in my case, I didn't feel that's necessary. Yeah. Um, so uh, the way we, um, the process of editing for us was to um, cut each scene individually um, without music. And, um, and and then string the different scenes in a large, longer sequence. Um, but uh, uh, the, the, then we, w once we did that, then we kind of had a, um, a, a rough outline of, 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 of the story. And um, we uh, used temp music to um, kind of adjust the level of the scene as far as kind of the tone of the scene. Um, we didn't, you know, we didn't use music in every scene, um, but there is a lot of music in our film, um, and um, and then we gave a fairly fine cut to our composer, and he, um, but we kind of gave him uh, total control to make whatever he wanted, um, but uh, the temp music was there for him to um, uh, kind of get the tone that we were going for in each specific scene. Um, so we did rely on music a bit to um, kind of control the ebb and flow, uh, the, uh, the emotions of, of each scene. Um, but then our composer came back with tracks that he had composed, most of which were very different than our than our temp music. And um, and then we worked with our composer, um, all four of the people, the key players, uh, my co-director. Uh, Tyler, who's here, um, and our composer and our editor, Alex, who just left. Um, we all live in different cities. <laughs> so we are doing everything, uh, emailing each other, project files. Uh, a couple of us had copies of the, the footage. Emailing project files, emailing back and forth with our composer, who lives in San Francisco. And so every the, the, the first time I met my composer and shook his hand was actually here. Um, <laughs> So, so um, we did everything long distance. I live in Denver, Tyler lives in San Diego, and our editor Alex lives in LA. So, um, but, but, um, so, uh, so anyways, it, it was a longer process because we couldn't be in the same room with our composer. Um, but he would email us tracks, and um, and we would just give him notes, and uh, that's kind of the way we attacked that. Uh, we record all, all of our own music um, with, uh, we play it, but we also play with uh, friends of ours. Um, uh, our first film arose out of a, uh, Donald's photography project and there was a, a, the way Donald would exhibit his photographs in public, um, sometime, occasionally there would be performances of the stills to music and we would play music uh, to accompany that. And what came out of that uh, project musically became the basis for October Country's music. Um, 
and we had we did a lot of recording of stuff. So I think it, it, it was just a lot of stuff laying around. So we st in the editing process we started editing with that material, and then there was additional stuff that we added as we went along. Um, this one, uh, Donald had another awesome idea with uh, using the Carter family's uh, No Depression in Heaven. Um, and I think it was, it was because we were cutting, I think, the, cutting the trailer for it, for grant financing. And he said, oh, let's, let's, let's use that. And it's a, it's a great, for me, it was a, I think it's a great song, period. But it's also a great song to cut to. And so we used that, but then we realized we could fit it in and have it hold. You know, sometimes when you're first trying to, you begin a film, you have all these things that are placeholders and then they fall away. But this one, it just stuck around. It kept sticking around. It kept sticking around. And then as we started recording music for the film, we, the first thought was, what if we stayed only with that piece of music and kept repeating it with different versions of that song, you know, and different iterations? And we, we tried to make the whole thing just that, but you can't do that because just, you know, how many times can you hear the same song? Um, but there are variation, the variations of music that are in that film are very close to uh, that original piece of music, which is both thematically connected and you know, just a great song, you know, and an American, a real piece of American history. You know. I think that's all we have to have for. Oh, we got one more, we got one more. Is there a last question before we wrap it up? No, let's wrap it up. Okay, thank you so much.